Right, well, good evening. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening for the Six Circle talk. Um, the title of the talk is The Art and Craft of Storytelling. Um, so, to put it in context, stories uh, are probably one of the earliest sort of ways of um, passing messages across throughout sort of all different traditions and civilizations. Um, even so obviously before the kind of dawn of writing, where many civilizations sort of relied on oral tradition, stories were sort of an integral part uh, to pass on uh, information and sort of uh, uh, and, and even sort of belief systems across. Obviously integral to the Muslim belief system and in fact generally the Judeo-Christian belief system within their holy books, uh, stories are relied upon a lot. Um, so clearly there is a wisdom in that and they are powerful means uh, to actually not simply obviously entertain but rather to actually have a much deeper effect on our view and our soul and our, and our perception of things. Um, to explore that more this, uh, this evening, we're very delighted to be joined by Professor Rehan Khan, um, who is also a former trustee of the City Circle uh, several years ago. I'm not sure if any of you were there around then and remember him. Um, so having been, although he resides currently in Dubai, he was born in the UK, um, and he works, his sort of day job uh, is in the corporate world uh, as a director of uh, a telecommunications company, uh, as well as a professor at a business school. But his focus today is something which um, really has been his passion, uh, I think, since he was a youngster, uh, which is writing and exploring the sort of creative process, um, and which really has uh, culminated in the publication of his first book, it was this year, uh, which uh, obviously he will comment on, which is available as well to purchase, The Last of the Tuscarai. Um, I won't sort of d detract anything else uh, in terms of what he's going to say. Um, in terms of a few logistical point of views, again, as we've been doing for the last few weeks, uh, we will be sort of live tweeting any comments. We welcome you, those who are on Twitter, to also join the debate. If you want to make any comments, uh, obviously if you, if you want to make comments about how awful the chair is, then perhaps refrain from that. Uh, but the, the CC handle is at the City Circle, uh, and the hashtag is hashtag CC Talks. Uh, but without further ado, I'll pass it over to Rehan. Okay. Great, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. If you don't mind, I'm going to come to the front and, and stand will be easier rather than uh, talking from there. So I hope my voice is traveling to the back. If it's not, then please do come forward. Okay, so I guess, thank you for the introduction, Arislan. Um, so I guess I've got three sort of professional pursuits that I have. You know, one is the, the day job, the other one is teaching at a business school, and the third one is the writing. And the best way of describing it would be very much that, you know, the day job puts bread on the table for the family, right? The professorship provides the butter, and then the novelist kind of provides the jam and the marmalade. So it doesn't always happen, right? Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Okay, so, you know, creativity um, and innovation. I think everyone has the ability to be creative and to be innovative. Because both creativity and innovation are human aptitudes. And like any other human aptitude, whether it's hand-to-eye coordination, whether it's musical ability, whether it's intelligence, it can be improved through instruction and through practice as well. So today is very much about creativity, but what we're going to talk about is how can the design process help really harness and really unleash the creativity when you're, when you're writing. Um, so today is very much about designing a story, um, and that's why we call it the art and craft of, of, of storytelling. It might come as a surprise to you, but um, certainly in my experience that um, when you're putting a novel together, something like 50% of the effort goes into actually designing it, and the other 50% goes into actually writing it. Now we're going to cover off what exactly that means from a, from a, from a design process, but think of it from a, uh, an architect design a, designing a building, and a you know, building contractor actually so, you know, building that as well. Okay. So, let's start with something um, quite easy to begin with. Let me ask you a couple of questions, all right? What's the purpose of reading? Why do you, why do people read? Why do you guys read? To feel. To feel. To feel, okay. Good. Anything else? To be entertained. To be entertained, yeah. To be informed. Informed, yeah. So, I think those are three pretty, you know, straightforward ones in terms of uh, we love to be entertained, we have a sense of escapism, and also to develop some kind of understanding of the world, to develop some kind of you know, perception um, of, of the world as well. So, um, and I think um, you know, one of the most 
The most memorable kind of books obviously do all of those three things. And what the writer's role is, <coughs> the writer's role is to really design a selection of elements to include in the story that will arouse a certain emotional response in the reader. Now that response might be one of fear, it might be one of excitement, it might be one of compassion. So let me give you an example. So who's read um, uh, Michael Mopergo's War Horse? Anyone read this? No? Oh, I'm surprised. No one's read it. Okay, so it's a story about a boy and a horse uh, at the time of the First World War, and, then they, and, and the war happens, and, and, and they get separated. Now, um, this story is particularly powerful because at the beginning of the book, you have this real sense of uh, love because the, uh, the horse and the boy are working the farm, okay, they're growing, they're bond. And then as the book progresses, you have this sense of fear because the First World War is approaching and you're fearful of what's going to happen. Then you have a sense of loss because they're separated. And at the end of the book, you have a sense of reunion. So what the novelist has done there is that they've designed a selection of elements to include in the story that arouse that certain emotional response, one of love, of fear, of loss, and of, 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 of reunion as well. Um, and clearly, with War Horse, it's a very entertaining book. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. It's a real page turner. You get a sense of escapism, because we're escaping to a period we haven't lived in, right? At the, at the time of the First World War. And also, we get a sense of understanding because ultimately it's an anti-war book about the horrors of war. And so that's, that comes across in that way. So as I said, the writer's role is very much to um, design a set of elements to arouse a certain emotional response in the reader. Now those elements are made up of uh, things like the setting of the novel. So where is the novel set? They're made up of what's the level of conflict that's taking place in the novel? You know, who are the characters? What's happening in the plot? Okay, these are all the elements that a storyteller needs to be thinking about. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through all of those. Now, as you're a sort of audience of uh, professional London people, um, I was also asked uh, to include some elements today um, around sort of management and how maybe some storytelling elements um, can sort of you know, relate to management and how we actually conduct ourselves in the workplace. So I'll be wearing kind of two hats, my novelist hat, and I'll, I'll flick over to a few kind of management things without making it boring at all, and I assure you of that. Okay, right, so um, let's start then with, um, in terms of uh, designing the actual setting of, of the novel. Now, when we say the location of the novel. Now, what could that be? What could location be? Geographic. It could be geographic. So, where is it? What else could location be? Time. Time. Contemporary, future. Anything else? Could be imaginary. Could be imaginary, like a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, a location could be any of those um, elements of that. Has anyone read um, The Shadow of the Wind? Yeah? So, do you remember where it was set? <laughs> Barcelona. Barcelona, that's right. So, The Shadow of the Wind is set in post-war Barcelona. And the main protagonist is Daniel Semperi, who is a young boy. And his father takes him to the secret cemetery of forgotten books. Now, what a wonderful sentence, right? The secret cemetery of forgotten books. So, it's a library where uh, all these old books, which no one reads anymore, are, are, are kept by these, uh, by these librarians. And Daniel is allowed to choose one book, and he must then guard that book for the rest of his life. And the book he actually chooses is a book called The Shadow of the Wind. So it's actually a mystery of a story within a story. And what makes it interesting is that it's set in post-war Barcelona, when uh, you know, there was the Franco dictatorship, there was a lot of political turmoil, there was a lot of injustice, and the police could do pretty much what they wanted. And by setting it in Spain at that time, it adds, you have these Tazbirai warriors who were once great and who united all these kingdoms, 
but now there's not many of them. It's the last of the Tazbirai, okay? Um, and all these kingdoms are just like busily, uh, you know, fighting with each other. Um, and they've forgotten that their actual real enemy is, is this, are these beings in the north called the Magrog. And so while they're busily fighting away and, you know, in their political machinations, the Magrog are sitting, watching, and waiting, and you kind of guess what's going to happen next, right? So, anyway, so I just wanted to uh, just uh, offer that as an illustration in terms of um, uh, some of the things that you need to be thinking about with regard to setting. Now, at this stage of the writing process, what the novelist and writer is, 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 is fundamentally asking themselves are a couple of questions. You know, who are the characters that I've actually designed this world, world in? You know, what are the characters thinking? What do they want? Why do they want it? How will they go about getting it? What stops them? You know, what are the consequences of failure? And you know, what action must be taken? Now, let's look at an example of this. So take the Lord of the Rings. Okay? Now, what does Frodo want in the Lord of the Rings? What does he want to do? Destroy the ring. He wants to destroy the ring. He wants to take that ring and go to Mount Doom and put it into the fires of Mount Doom. Right? What does uh, the Dark Lord Sauron want? He wants the ring, right? What does the ring want? The ring wants to go back to its creator, back to Sauron. Now immediately what you have there is you have conflict. And conflict is absolutely essential to creating a compelling story. Because the reader will read that. They'll be interested. They'll be pulled in by conflict. If you don't have that conflict, okay, it's going to be a pretty boring kind of read. Okay. Now... So these are some of the questions which uh, the, uh, the novelist is, is thinking about at this stage of the design process. Now, one thing I, I would say here is also any of any of you who have sort of managed to, uh, managed teams of people. Uh, I certainly, you know, in, in my experience, whenever I have, you know, these are some of the questions I ask as well. So you know, who are my team members? You know, when, I, when I've taken over them, you know, what are they thinking in terms of uh, me, and what are they thinking about each other, right? What do they want? Does someone want to get a promotion? Does the guy want my job? Does he want to quit? Right? Uh, uh, what are they thinking? Um, how are they going to go about getting it? Right? So in terms of the objectives that we set our staff, what stops them? So is it the competition? Is it the regulation? Is it internal you know, procedural and governance? Is it someone from compliance who's stopping them? I'm looking at my brother-in-law because he works in compliance. Um, and, uh, you know, what are the consequences of, of, of failure? So, is the company going to go bust? Um, and what action do we need to take? So, these are things which I think every executive, every manager uh, will also be asking, right? And I think these are things that, which, which are fundamental to how we, actually, uh, how, we actually, how we actually manage as well. Okay, so, what we've been looking at so far then is really... Uh, the element of the setting, in terms of uh, how do we design the setting. Let's now look at conflict. How do we actually design the conflict? So, uh, the conflict is essentially the kind of the type of struggle uh, that's taking place in the novel. So, for instance, in Animal Farm, what's the conflict? What's the struggle that's taking place? Is it, is it uh, upper class and lower class. Yeah, upper class and lower. Class. Yeah, it could be that. Anything else? Power. It's a political struggle for power, yeah. Any anyone else like Leader, making a comment? Sorry? Taking over power. Yeah, so the so you say obviously you know anyone who hasn't read it, so the animals <laughs> overthrow the farmer, they take over the farm, right? Um, and they want to run it. But over a period of time, you know, some animals like the pigs are more uh, take over control and, and they subvert the other <coughs> other animals. Now George Orwell, as you probably know was writing a, a metaphor for the Russian Revolution, for how he saw sort of the whole Russian Revolution essentially derail um, and become sort of, you know, the Stalinist dictatorship. But I'd say it's also quite true for most revolutions as well. If you look from a historical perspective, generally the revolutionaries tend to become just as bad as the people they overthrew as well. So as a fable, as a metaphor, I think it holds true um, across, across time. Has anyone read Flowers for Algernon? No? 
These are award-winning books, guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I reread that one, but I hated it. You read it a long time ago. Okay. So the story is about um, uh, uh, someone called Charlie Gordon who has a mental disorder, and he has an IQ of 65. He then goes through an experiment, um, and he becomes super smart, and his IQ goes up to 185. But what he realizes at that time is that all the people he thought were his friends in the bakery where he worked were actually making fun of him. Okay. And now he's actually so smart that he doesn't have any friends anymore. Okay. Now, over a period of time, the experiment that was done on him starts, the, the effects of it start to wear off. And so he starts, he, he goes back to essentially becoming the way he was before. Yeah. Now, it's written in the first person uh, diary format. So we actually, you know, when the book starts, <coughs> you have Charlie's very poor, constructed English, then the novel sort of goes to literary heights, and then it goes back again as well. Now, that type of conflict is not a huge you know, battle scene, it's not a revolution taking place, but it's inner, it's inside the character. And that can be very, very powerful as well. As What's the name of that again? Flowers for Algonon. And Algonon is actually the mouse that they experiment on before Charlie. Uh, but it was, uh, again, an award-winning book, uh, written in the 1960s. Um, yeah. Is that just, by the way, is that like an allegory, is that a metaphor for aging, for growing up out of childhood, reaching the peak and then losing again? Or? So is that a metaphor for aging in terms of, yeah, it could be seen as that, definitely, uh, because we all start help, you know, helpless, right? And then we kind of end up like that as well at the end, right? It's a bit of a uh, morbid thought, but that's, um, unfortunately, that's what it is. So yes, it is actually. And I think if you read the, the notes, uh, from the writer that does come across as well. Okay, so conflict can be um, of, uh, of, many of many different types. Now, <clears throat> the thing that really I think a lot of writers struggle with is designing the meaning or the theme of the novel. And I think when you start off the writing process, you're kind of not quite sure, um, what am I writing about? Am I writing a story about you know, love? Am I writing a story about compassion? Is it about courage? It's kind of a little bit fuzzy, yeah? Um, and so what you kind of do is you, you, you construct a story. Uh, and most writers start with what's, what's called like a kind of a basic premise, a, a what if moment, right? What if such and such a thing happened? Now, let me just read you a what if for a, for a novel. I, I hope you can recognize this one. <laughs> so let me describe it first of all. Um, so what if an aspiring writer and recovering alcoholic accepts a position as the off-season caretaker of an isolated hotel in the Colorado Rockies and snow sets in okay, and uh, supernatural forces take over and the guy goes nuts and puts his family in danger. What book is that? The Shining. The Shining. Ray. Well done. You got that one. Excellent. So, but you see what Stephen King does, he often starts like that, you know, what if you know, a bunch of vampires invaded small town America? Salem's lot, yeah? Um, likewise, does anyone read young adult fiction? So, let me see if you can get this, guess this one. What if MI6 uh, recruited a schoolboy to infiltrate the world's most dangerous criminal mastermind. What book is that? Alex Ryder. Oh. Alex Ryder series. That's right, Stormbreaker, right? So again, it's kind of that's where you start with. So what if such and such thing happened? Now, as you progress along that kind of you know what if uh, piece, there are uh, one of the things that the writer really needs to start thinking about is what are the values uh, that I'm trying to uh, play positively and negatively in the story. So, for instance, is my story about hope or is it about despair but if my book is about hope I have to show despair we can connect with each other despite our differences but when we go to the extreme that's when society essentially becomes polarized and then you have conflict and, and so on so these were some, some of the themes that um, I was working with as I was writing the story but it didn't become really clear until I actually finished the novel and I thought ah oh, okay that's what I was kind of writing about really um, now, I, I'm going to um, switch the time now. Okay. Do you guys want to hear anything on the corporate side, or should I skip the corporate side? 
Skip it. Okay, I'll skip it. Because I was asked to put in a few things on the corporate side as well. Okay, I'll skip this one. I was going to talk about uh, uh, management meaning, but I guess you guys are a little bit bored about that. So I'll skip that. I was going to talk about two companies um, and, and what they do about storytelling and narrative. But let me skip that. Can we not hear it? Yeah. 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 You want to hear it? Okay, so we have some people want to hear it. Okay, look. So what I was going to say was that, you know, uh, what um, essentially you know, good management is really about um, uh, telling a kind of a narrative and story across the organization that's all-encompassing, uh, that's persistent, and that everyone will actually buy into with, you know, with their heart very much. And if you look at uh, these two companies, so for instance, Toyota, that Toyota's story, their narrative, is what? It's capturing the wisdom of every employee. That's the story that they tell. So if you walk into a Toyota manufacturing plant, what you'll see is that every sort of X number of meters, there's a cord hanging from the ceiling. It's called the Andon cord. And any employee, no matter how senior or junior, if they see a problem on the assembly line, it's their responsibility to pull that cord. Now, when that cord is pulled, the entire assembly line stops, which costs money. But Toyota congratulate the employee for saying, well done. Because for them, you know, today's problem is tomorrow's opportunity. Right? And that's the story that everyone is told. And if you become a new manager in an assembly plant for Toyota, you have to spend your first day in this red box in the middle of the factory floor. And you're not allowed to leave that box until you find something on the assembly line that can be improved. And then you're allowed to leave. Now we're talking about Toyota. We're not talking about some kind of Mickey Mouse you know, manufacturing company. This, this is a company that already has very high standards. Because Toyota wants to ingrain it into every employee you know, that it's your responsibility. Yeah. We want to capture that wisdom. Whole Foods, if you haven't heard of them, have about 200 uh, grocery stores around the world. They're America's most profitable retailer, uh, sorry, grocer by per square foot. Now, traditionally, in a, in a retail environment, what happens is that you have someone who is essentially who buys stuff, who packages it, who prices it, who tells the people in the shop where to put it on the shelf. But in Whole Foods, each market runs, each sorry store runs independently, and each within each store, there are teams made up of eight people who essentially make all of the operating decisions. Because Whole Foods' story is one of creating a sense of love creating a sense of community and, um, uh, and you know, bringing people together in that sense. And of course in the corporate sector we don't tend to hear about love very often, but that's very important to, to Whole Foods' story. So uh, these teams of eight people decide everything in terms of pricing, positioning, where to source the, the food uh, products and so on. And every four weeks the profitability per team is measured across all the Whole Foods stores. So every team can see how they're doing against all the other teams um, and they can see their compensation, what they're earning, against what other people are earning as well. Because the message is very simple. It's, <coughs> it is you, rather than someone sitting in head office, who is responsible for your success. Yeah. And so that's the story that Whole Foods tells very, very well. Okay. Anyway, let me get back to storytelling. So that was, um, I can talk more about this if you want in, in, in the Q&A. Now, um, the other thing that the writer needs to be thinking about uh, when you're actually constructing your story is what is the inciting incident? Now, this is really the trigger. <coughs> this is when the story really kicks into place. You know, something very significant happens. So, it radically upsets the balance of forces in the life of the protagonist. It might skew it from very much a negative to a positive or vice versa. So, in the book Jaws, right, what's the inciting incident in Jaws? Shark attack. Yeah, the shark. The shark eats a swimmer, right? It's kind of like obvious. But what happens after that? Anyone remember? The town becomes kind of scared to go to the beach. Yeah, the town becomes scared to go to the beach. So what happens? The sheriff goes and reports to the mayor that, you know, Mr. Mayor, we've got to shut the beach. The mayor says, hey, it's tourism season. We're going to lose a tourist, right? So it's a moral dilemma. Do they shut the beach? Don't they shut the beach? And of course they don't shut the beach, but what happens? The shark eats someone else as well, right? So there's a moral dilemma. 
What's the inciting incident in the book, The Firm? I'm hoping there's some lawyers and you'd have read that, right? Mm -hmm. What's the inciting incident in The Firm? Any lawyers in the room? No? Okay, so there's a young hotshot lawyer who gets a job which is too good to be true. And the job is too good to be true because the law firm that he's working for is essentially a front for the mafia, right? So what does he do? You know, the, the benefits are great, right? But, or, or, or does he actually say, no, I'm going to quit this, right? So it's a very interesting book, and they made a movie about it a number of years ago with Tom Cruise as well, uh, back in the 90s, I think it was. So that, that's the firm. That's the inciting incident in the firm. Okay, so let's do one more inciting incident. What's the insight, and if you guys don't get this, I'll be very disappointed. What's the inciting incident in Harry Potter? <laughs> yeah, it's Hagrid, but what happens to Harry? Comes a wizard. He discovers he's a wizard, yay! He got it, well done. So that's the inciting incident in, 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 in Harry Potter. He discovers he's a wizard, okay? Um, has anyone read um, um, Divergent? Or seen the film? Yeah? What's the inciting incident in Divergent? <laughs> Sorry? She doesn't fit the mold. She doesn't fit the mold, she's divergent. But that's not the inciting incident. What's the inciting Because it radically changes the life of the protagonist. Something else happens. She doesn't follow her parents. She doesn't follow her parents. She doesn't. So the main, main character, Beatrice, doesn't follow the faction of her parents, which is abnegation. And she goes to another faction, uh, which is dauntless, right? So that's the main inciting incident. So the writer needs to be thinking about, you know, what's the inciting incident? When will the story really kick into place and just change the, the, the life of the, of the protagonist? Okay. And essentially, what that does, it sets up a, a sets up a, a kind of a quest, and the quest might be for justice, might be for uh, for love. Um, uh, it could be a, 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 num a number of different things. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, let's move on from this to. Um, talking about character and how do we look at designing character now we start with characterization what could characterization mean when I say when I say that what, what, what do you think that means any idea building a character yeah but what 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 specifically about that that history the history yeah anything else personality personality yeah could be that yeah, what makes them different? So the, the characterization is essentially you know, what does this character look like? How tall, short, fat, thin? Uh, how intelligent are they? It's, it's the physical appearances. It's what you can see. Okay, so that's something that the writer needs to be thinking about. Characterization. Very, very important. And we've all read you know, Willy Wonka, I mean, uh, uh, Charlie and Chocolate Factory. And, you know, Willy Wonka is such a, a wonderful and memorable character. Because he's so eccentric and, and, and the, way he, the way he comes across, right? Very memorable. But then you have true character. Now, true character we only discover when we put the character under pressure. The more pressure we exert on the character, the truer the telling of what their actual character is. And it's the same, in, uh, it's, it's, it's also true in life because. You know, when times are good, right, everyone can be good. But when times get tough, is that person still dignified? Are they still noble in their conduct? Or do they become a little bit nasty? So we find out what our characters are like by putting pressure on the character. And the writer must put as much pressure on the character as possible. I'm sure a lot of you would have read at school I certainly hope so. The Lord of the Flies? Yeah. Okay. So obviously the boys uh, crash on a desert island, right? So you have the character of, uh, of, um, of Ralph. Now Ralph is trying to organize a rescue, yeah? And, and Piggy is actually the voice of reason. And he's very sensible. But Jack Meridew is going very tribal and he has his bloodlust, right? And so what the writer William Golding was really expressing through Jack Meridew was uh, the worst of human nature. Yeah. So as the pressure mounts, he becomes more and more brutal. He becomes more and more tribal. And so he's kind of a vehicle for that expression of the worst of, of human nature. Um, 
Now, so the, so the writer has to progressively build up the pressure on, on the character. Now, in, say, for instance, you know, The Lord of the Rings, towards the end of the third book, you know, Frodo uh, says to Sam, you know, Sam, go back to the Shire. I don't want you with me. Right? But, but Sam made this promise, and he said to Mr. Frodo, I will be with you till the end. Right? And despite being heartbroken when Frodo sends him away to don't come back, Sam comes back because at heart he's a good person. Yeah? At heart he's a good person. And he saves his friend from that, you know, the giant spider that's about to eat him, right? So when the when the when the writer has progressively built up the pressure on the character, how does that character respond at that moment? And Sam responds, you know, with dignity and, and with honour because he's actually um, a good person. If it was a D, or if you are a D yourself, once you've done the, done the profile, some of the areas that Ds tend to um, fall down on a little bit, and they need to improve, is that they tend to create an environment of fear around them. They tend to be quite intolerant, very insensitive, you know, quite blunt as well. And so in order to communicate and deal with a D, uh, there's a certain way you have to sort of, you know, deal with them. I'm not going to go into that, because that's going to be... Uh, that's another lecture. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I can, I can give you some advice. Um, uh, likewise, uh, there are people who sort of I's, uh, S's, and C's. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. But if someone wants to talk to me about behavioral design, I'll, 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 I'll do this afterwards. Otherwise, we're going to go into Mugrin uh, as well. So let me skip through this. Um, so the other thing, which I, uh, getting back to the writing, that we need to be thinking about at this stage is really uh, the type of plot that we're talking about. Okay. Now, um, you know, plot is about causality. So A happened because B happened, <coughs> and B happened because C happened, and C happened because D happened. But if D didn't happen, would, would A have happened? Right? So it's about causality. So for instance, I think it was the writer, um, I think it was Kipling who said that, you know, the king died and the queen died. That's a story. Okay. But the king died and then the queen died of grief. Okay. That's a plot because there's causality there. Right? So um, generally it's kind of perceived that there are about seven different types of uh, plots that writers will work with. There are more, but there are generally seven types. One is the overcoming the monster type of plot. Now in this one, the, the, the protagonist will set off to, to the main character, will set off to defeat the forces of antagonism that might be threatening their land or their country or their livelihood or their way of life. Can you think of any uh, novels you may have read which fall into this particular uh, plot type? Dune? Dune? Yeah, okay. Could be, could be. Anything else? Lord of the Rings. I would say Lord of the Rings is a quest. Very possible. Harry Potter, yeah, yeah, overcoming Voldemort, yeah. Anything else? Star Wars. Star Wars, yep, yeah, could be. So on my list, I had uh, novels like uh, obviously Perseus's, uh, you know, uh, journey to head, cut head of the user and come back to kill the Kraken, uh, Bear Worlds, War of the Worlds, and so on. So that's one kind of uh, plot type. Another kind of plot is the rags to riches plot. Now in this one, uh, the the protagonist, who's generally quite poor. Um, goes through suddenly a period of wealth or has some status uh, but then they kind of lose that but they learn a lesson along the way can you think of any uh, novels that fit into the rags to riches type of plot great expectations great expectations yeah i yeah okay yeah definitely anything else aladdin yeah, possibly, possibly. Yeah, poss yes, possibly, yeah. Okay, I also had then, you know, Cinderella uh, and Great Expectations there as well. Okay. Slumdog Millionaire. Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> yeah, could be, could be, could be. Uh, but it's not a book, right? It is. Is it a book? Oh, it was a book, yeah. It was, Okay, uh, then we've got the quest. So the protagonist and generally a bunch of companions will set off on a journey to uh, you know, recover an object or to get to a particular land. And as, as uh, the gentleman at the front said, the Lord of the Rings, uh, also the last uh, 
Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, who was there to go out and find these horcruxes, right? It's kind of a quest. So it goes from being overcoming the monster to very much like a quest kind of uh, story. Then we have the Voyage and Return. Now the Voyage and Return uh, plot type is one where the protagonist will set off, usually to some kind of strange land, and they'll overcome these obstacles, and then they're going to journey back to their own land, but they're only going to journey back with the experience, nothing else. Can you think of any books that fit into this particular? The Hobbit. Oh, what, sorry? The Hobbit. The Hobbit, yeah. The Alchemist. Yeah, the Alchemist, yeah. He kind of comes back to, back to where he started from and then realizes what he was looking for was where he, where he started. The Odyssey. The Odyssey, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I had uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, Chronicles of Narnia, you can have the Odyssey as well uh, there. Then we have the kind of the comedy plot, so this is very, kind of generally very light. A comical kind of plot, something like you know, Midsummer's Night's Dream, uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Then you have the tragedy plot. Now the tragedy plot is interesting because in this one, the main protagonist is usually the villain. And their death actually makes the world a better place. Can you think of any novels that fit into that? The Perfume. The Perfume. I haven't read that. I'll have to take your word for it. The yeah, could be, yeah. Anything else? So, on my list I had uh, Macbeth and Julius Caesar as well. And then finally we have uh, the kind of the rebirth plot. Now, in this one the protagonist will be generally kind of like an unlikable type of person um, and then they get transformed and they become kind of like likable towards the end of the, end of the book. Any, any books that come to mind? A Christmas Carol, yeah. Okay. And I think even if you look at that plot type, uh, some some uh, recent movies, right, have also had that type of plot, where you have there was quite a, a a very popular animated movie in recent years, where you had a very unlikable protagonist who kind of became quite nice towards the end of it. Can you think of what that was? Shrek. Frozen. Shrek. Frozen. No, I think of something else. Despicable, Despicable Me, Man. yeah, Gru, yeah, so, so he becomes like, kind of like nice after he meets all the girls and so on, and happy and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's the kind of the rebirth type of plot and it works in, in films and it works also in, in novels as well. Now, here's some uh, plotting by J.K. Rowling of, you know, of, of obviously who wrote Harry Potter. Now you can see that when you're working with a number of different characters, um, then you kind of have to construct your thinking very much about okay, what's happening to which character in what scene, how are all these characters meeting, you know, what's the conflict, or what's the tension between the characters, because you can have such a diverse <coughs> array of characters, you know, they, need to, they basically need to sort of bounce off each other, because that tension, that conflict, is what makes the story interesting. Yeah. Here's another one, uh, Joseph Hellier, who wrote Catch-22, which is an anti-war book. Um, and you can see you know, he's gone to, again, great uh, detail there about what's happening to what character, which chapter, uh, at, at what stage of the novel as well. Here's an example from uh, when I was writing the second book uh, for Last of the Tazburi. So this is over the Christmas period, and I was just working on the design for, for the book. And essentially what I did was that all these bits of paper are different chapters. Uh, my brief note on the chapters, there's about 50 chapters there, there's about 15 more chapters that are going to be in the novel as well. And I said, okay, so in this particular chapter, this character is doing this thing. And uh, this is the kind of conflict, this is what's happening. In this chapter, this, 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 uh, this thing is happening. Now what this um, certainly allowed me to do, is it gives you kind of a helicopter view of the entire story. And you can see then that, okay, so what's the pace of the novel? How am I pacing it? So it starts really fast. Does it slow down there? Is it boring? Do I need to kill someone? You know, make it more interesting? Or what do I need to do? Yeah, so just, just looking at that overall allows you to get a, a sense of the flow and the pace. Because no one wants to read something that's boring, right? I mean, it's like, you know, who wants to read something boring? You want to read something which is pacey. And also, you know, uh, using the metaphor of a car, you know, when am I going to put the book into fifth gear? And when am I going to really floor it? So that when the reader is actually reading, 
they get a sense of like breathlessness that oh, oh my god what's going to happen like it's a real page turn uh, and that's uh, and you get that by if you can you know, look at your book visually in that way it gives you that sense overall okay okay so i think that's that's all i was really going to say um let me just conclude then by saying that um um, if anyone's interested, obviously after uh, Margaret, if you want to uh, do us some Q and A or whatever, we can we can do that. Uh, if anyone would like to buy the book, uh, it's at the back, uh, five pounds. If you do have the money, take the book, put the money in charity. That's fine as well, no worries at all. Uh, but I just it'd be quite interested to get your comments if you have an opportunity to read the book as well. So, Arsalam, thank you. Thank you very much. You do a few people actually. So um, just go ahead. If you want to make a comment or anything, um, I guess just keep it brief. And if uh, I do find you all sort of going on, we'll cut you off. Don't take first Okay, let's kick it off with that. Okay. At the start of the um, I just wanted to do ask a two part question. What was the source for your inspiration for writing this book? And how long did you have it sort of stuck in your head before you finally decided to start writing it? Okay, so the inspiration was, well, I've always been interested in writing. And about sort of six, five years ago, my daughter, who was about who was six at the time, we were sitting for breakfast, and she said to me, uh, she said, Abu, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> <laughs> and clearly, going to a, a, an office in her expectations didn't count as a proper job, right? <laughs> I wasn't like a fireman or a doctor or something. So that was, uh, it really got me thinking hard that, hmm, yeah, actually, you know, I really should do something because I've always had a passion for writing. Mm. Now, in terms of the second part of the question, then, with regards to uh, how long. So this particular story took about four to five years. Because obviously, I've got a you know, daytime job as well, and I teach as well in the evenings. Um, it took about four to five years. But it took me about two years to find the voice of the characters. So there's five main protagonists, there's three female leads and there's two male leads. Um, and it took about two years just to, just to get their voice right, because again, as a reader, you don't want to be reading something that all the characters sound the same, right? So some might be more austere, some might be more colloquial, and so on. So it was about two years of just uh, writing, writing, practicing writing, uh, designing, structuring, all the things that we, we went through. Um, and then probably another two years of actually then just writing. And I tend to write by hand because uh, it just, um, I find it's easier you know, not, uh, to be more, much more imaginative. And then I put it into, <coughs> onto screen afterwards. Yeah. Um, why, why did you choose the option of self-publishing? And you mentioned that you were going to do a, choose a different route for the next book. Or I didn't quite catch that. So what will you be doing next in terms of publishing? Yeah. So, um, so essentially, what I did is I went down. I, I looked around the sort of you know the main street publishers and agents and stuff. So I thought, well, let me try and go out to the market and actually create sort of a concept idea myself and self-publish it. Uh, talk about it, uh, promote it, um, and then hopefully. Or based on that, catch the attention of an agent or, or, or a larger publisher once they've seen there's some success. So I went down that route. Um, there are a number of different groups of self publishing routes. Amazon has a subsidiary called Create Space, so they're the ones who I use, uh, and basically publish uh, and then it's published on demand. Um, and of course, you can always you know, publish directly onto Kindle or iTunes as well. But the key thing is, if you're going to go down the self-publishing route, you must try and get a good editor uh, before you put it out. Um, and uh, certainly when I wrote my, this is kind of my second book, and the first book I wrote was for a younger audience, and it wasn't really good enough to, to be published. And one of the mistakes I made is that I think a lot of us you know, who work in the corporate sector, what we do is when we write, we're trained to sit on the fence. So when we write emails and letters, we say, it could be suggested, okay? perhaps, maybe, right? But when you're writing literature, that's kind of like poison. You have to use the active voice, you have to be direct. And so my first novel was very much like that. It was sort of very kind of sitting on the fence. And uh, when I read it again, I thought, oh God, this is crap, yeah? I mean, the story was good, but the writing was appalling. Uh, and that's the mistake I made, and I think an editor can, can help you. And so I had a, a very good editor here locally in, in the UK who helped me with um, 
with uh, this particular novel, more from the perspective of, of grammar and sentence structure and things like that. In the corner? Sorry. Yeah, so um, what made you decide to do a fantasy setting for this book? So what made me decide to do a fantasy setting for the book? I think um, what the, the fantasy genre allows you to do is really weave in different kind of elements. As I said, um, you know, I was very influenced by Aristotle's you know, notions of you know, virtues and of courage and of the golden mean. And I thought in a fantasy setting I could, I could do that. Um, I could construct that world. And also I was quite interested in being able to essentially construct a world that was believable as well, um, where you had these kind of you know, Tazburi warriors who were the best of the people at one point, but they're not anymore. Um, and I think there are many nations uh, and many um, cultures around the world who would probably, you know, they'd resonate with that. They'd say, yeah, we, we actually used to be really good one time. You know, what happened to us, right? Um, and so it's, it, that, I think, allowed, the fantasy kind of genre allowed me to play, play with those messages that I was trying to get across. Um, how long, I mean, you mentioned it took about two years to get characters and voices, but did you actually have to do a lot of research into just theories, concepts, um, places, and how long did that take? Okay, so you actually made a, a lot of research into theories and concepts and places and so on. I, I think you do, because um, you know, each character, so for instance, you know, the main character, uh, who's on the back of the novel here, uh, Suri Yi, so she's about 50 years of age, Tadburai Grandmaster, so I was thinking, well, what... How would you know, she talk? Right? What would be her intonation, her tone of voice, the way she conducted herself? How would she dress? Um, and then her apprentice, Aiden, you know, how would he be? He's like a 16 year old. Okay. So again, there's a lot of research you have to do about not only the, if, I, if you remember I said characterization and then true character, a lot of research you do at that point, but also when it comes to names. I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the names. So Suri Yi. So Suri uh, in the Persian it means uh, sort of you know princess, and Yi in Mandarin means kind of righteousness. Yeah. So that was something that was important. Whereas one of the uh, and, and the weapon that she wields is called Shamshir, which is obviously a very famous you know uh, weapon for in, in, in Persian mythology. Um, likewise, one of the main antagonists is called Naram Sin. Now, Naram Sin was actually the first um, Akkadian king uh, back in about 2,500 BC who actually declared himself to be a god. He said to his people, I am God, worship me. Okay? So anyone who kind of knows the history or wants to go back and look at the name, that name means something. Um, so every single character's name has been chosen for a specific reason. Um, Adan, who's the, the, the young Tazboy apprentice, uh, and it's in Spanish it means uh, man of the earth. Okay. And the weapon he wields is called Tizona. Uh, Tizona was a, uh, means, uh, as, as a weapon, uh, that means firebrand. And it was a weapon that was wielded by, uh, that was wielded by uh, the Spanish conqueror El Cid. So again, I've kind of done a lot of research in that, and that was very important to me, to make sure it was constructed well. And maybe you know you can go out and once you've read the book, you can let me know what you found about the naming convention. Um, yeah, we have gentlemen from the front. Um, that's good. Okay. Do you have a, a purpose, an objective, uh, generally speaking, in life? For instance, you are writing a novel for the public, for people. Can you think of? People beyond all of humanity you have a purpose in your writing. Okay, so is there a purpose to my writing? Um, well, in terms of what I was trying to get across, as a message you mean, yeah? Okay. Well, I think ultimately you have, you have to start with the story first of all, you know, because you can't come across as being pretentious and saying, well, I'm writing a book about this, right? So ultimately it's got to be a story that connects to sort of a, a wider human story which people will recognize, no matter what culture they come from, they'll recognize, yeah, we, we understand when someone's being arrogant, we understand when someone's being humble, yeah, we get this thing about courage, and what does, you know, uh, what does it mean to be courageous today? 
does it mean being reckless, or does it mean have, having being able to control your anger? Yeah. So those were, I think, um, it was fundamentally about the story, but then if I could uh, also maybe weave in some messages about uh, things that were important to me, the of what I was writing remained true, but the, the, the environment, you know, the setting, the characters, the plot, everything I spoke about today, it all changed. And that's why I say 50% of the effort of putting a novel out is actually design. How am I designing it? Because once you get the design right, then your creati creativity will be unleashed totally. Uh, and you'll be much more of, a, of an efficient writer. Um, and um, often you hear about writers you know, throwing away hundreds of pages of, of work. And that just, just doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> so I'd, I'd rather much, uh, write much more efficiently and spend a lot more time in design. You know, if any of you have worked in, in Japan, you'll know they have the, uh, uh, the Kuritsu kind of model of, of, of work, where all these different uh, tables will actually agree on a strategy, which takes a long time, and then they'll execute. When they execute, they execute very quickly. Whereas in sort of Anglo-American culture, there's more an execution, less on design and thinking about why we're doing it, which is why you often have a lot of companies failing, starting, failing, and so on. So I took the more sort of, I suppose, Eastern route of, of writing as opposed to the you know, Anglo-American route. Okay, um, we have maybe two more questions. That was the gentleman. You know what? Ironically, that was my question. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> there we go. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Um, we'll give it to Nate as an answer. Did you ever feel a sense of conflict between knowing that you're a target audience that you're going to write for and what segment of the market you're targeting, and then also having all these um, literary aspects and like philosophies that you wanted to incorporate? So was there a conflict between writing for a particular segment uh, and also some of the more philosophical elements I was trying to get across? Um, I don't think there was because I think, you know, um, words like philosophy and you know, metaphysics, they can come across as being these really highbrow esoteric ideas. But ultimately it's about you know, living a better life, right? You know, a lot of philosophy is about understanding how to live a better life. Um, and I think whether you're talking to a younger person or an older person, if you can couch it in words which they will understand, then you can get that meaning across. You know, also the, you know, the Prophet Muhammad on many occasions said, you know, speak to people at their level. So I think there's great wisdom in that. If you speak to people at a level that they'll understand without trying to make it too complex, um, you know, why write an overtly too literary novel when that target audience won't get it, but at the same time try and get some philosophical ideas across in a language that they might, might understand as well. So I don't think I, I experienced that conflict. Okay, um, last question. Uh, yes, uh, it might be a technical detail, but do we visualize you sitting in a dark room when you're writing, <laughs> or do you use voice recognition when you get an idea, you are somewhere out, you put it in and have it for yeah, okay, so, so when I'm writing, am I writing in a dark room or do, do I just uh, use some technology? Well, I think um, there's two things. Uh, writers and journalists always have a very uh, high-tuned antenna, you know, looking at things, looking at the world. And you're always looking for quirky things in the world. You're thinking, oh, I could use that. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's interesting. Um, so I think you're always, you know, you're always scanning. But when it comes to the writing process, what I found is that you have to be very disciplined. So for me, I, I generally, my day starts early, I'm up at 5.30, uh, I normally sleep at 10 o'clock, so I get my, I get my sleep. Um, and then I spend my morning time essentially writing before I get to my day job, which starts at 9 o'clock. Uh, so I have a, a very structured period where I will write, I'll be in the house generally, um, and then once I'm into a kind of rhythm of writing, then, whether I go and write in the coffee shop and all the noise of the coffee shop has become a background noise, or whether I go and sit somewhere else in the park and write, it, it works. I can just start scribbling. But I think the key thing is, is to get that momentum. You know, and once, like many things in life, once you're into that momentum and you found your pace and you found your, you know, uh, essentially how, how quickly you're running, then you can, you can write anywhere. But it's, it's just getting to that first is, is very tricky. And that requires a lot of effort uh, and a lot of um, self-doubt as well.
Okay, great. Um, that's all we've got time for in terms of the formal Q&A. Um, Rehan will be sticking around for the sort of 10 15 minutes here, so obviously feel free to come to the front and ask Rehan questions. Uh, so copies of the book are available at the back as well uh, for purchase, um, and I think Rehan will also be signing if you, if you wish. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Um, okay. uh, thank you very much as well for this.